Chapter 11 Deadly Rivals When Kunti returned to Astinapur with the five Pandava brothers, not everyone was happy to see them. With the passing of King Pandu, the duties of king remained with Dhritarashtra until Yudhisthira, the eldest son of Pandu, came of age. This created tension between the two sets of cousins, the Pandavas, the sons of Pandu, and the Karvas, the sons of Dhritarashtra. The Pandava children were far ahead of the Karvas in intelligence, learning ability, and physical strength. The Rodin, the eldest of the Karva brothers, quickly realized that Bhim especially posed a great physical threat to him and his brothers. Bhim often wrestled the Karva brothers into submission, embarrassing them in all competitions of strength. The Ryodin grew a deep hatred for the mighty Pantava brother. One day, the Ryodin proposed a trip to the river Ganga for all the cousins. Everyone had a grand day. When the opportunity presented itself, the Ryodin poisoned Bhim's food. Bhim had a ravenous appetite and gobbled up all of his meals. At the end of the day, the cousins returned to the palace. Beam, however, passed into a coma near the river. Unseen by the others, the eldest Karava bound Beam's hands and feet and rolled him into the river, leaving him to drown. He then returned to the palace. When Yudhisthira noticed Beam missing, he asked the others where his brother might be. No one had any answers. Meanwhile, Beam sank deep into the river. The Nagas, the serpent creatures, surrounded him and bit him repeatedly. In a twist of fate, their venom counteracted the poison from the food and Beam awoke. He easily broke his bindings and then grabbed the Nagas and smashed them against the riverbed. The Nagas, terrified, swam to Vasuki, the king of the Naga world. When the Naga king realized that this mighty young man was the son of Vayu, the wind god, he invited Bhim into the Naga palace. To help Bhim recover from his ordeal, the king presented him with pots of a potion called Rasakunda, which is known to increase strength. After swallowing eight vessels full of the nectar, Bhim went off to sleep. The king then returned the young Pandava to the surface. When Bhim returned to the palace, much to Dhirodhan's surprise, he related his fabulous tale to his mother and brothers. Yudhisthira suspected Dhirodhan of foul play, but they had no evidence. The Pandava brothers realized that they would need to be much more cautious with their deadly cousin in the future. Chapter 12 Son of the Sun When Drona's training with the young princes was complete, Bhishma arranged a contest to display the prince's great skill to the nation. In the first competition, the Ryodin and Beam faced off to display their fighting skills with a mace. The fight soon escalated to the point that it appeared it would be a battle to the death between the two princes. Ashvatama, the son of Drona, had to intervene to break up the match. Eventually, Drona's star pupil, Arjun, took the stage. Arjun fired arrows into the ground and created fire. Then he fired arrows into the sky and water rained down to put out the fire. In a display of mystical skill, Arjun used the arrows to turn invisible. The stadium crowd roared with delight at the skill the young prince displayed. Drona called to the crowd, Behold, the greatest archer of our time. There is none who could match his skill. Just then, a mysterious figure entered the stadium. Guru Drona, Arjuna is not the greatest archer. I am. The crowd went silent, all trying to catch a glimpse of the boastful young man. In a matter of minutes, the young man showed off a dazzling display of archery skill, equaling that of Arjun. Who are you, young man? asked Drona. I am Karna, and I challenge your star pupil in a contest to the death. Arjun was taken aback. In order to challenge a prince, you must be of royalty. What kingdom do you hold? asked Drona. Karna stayed silent. In the audience watching, the Ryodin was impressed by the young man. Guru Drona, I hereby crown Karna as the king of Anga 
with immediate effect. This should fulfill any rules or regulations that may be required. And the contest between Arjun and Kana can go ahead. A charioteer in the audience burst out to tears. My son, I am so proud of you. You now have a kingdom. When Bhishma witnessed this, he inquired as to Kana's lineage. Who are your parents, young man? asked Bhishma. Great Bhishma, I, Adirata, am the adopted father of Kana, said the old man. The son of a charioteer cannot challenge a royal prince. Who are your real parents? asked Bhishma. The young man's face grimaced in anger. He had no idea who his true parents were, and as such, he had no rights to challenge a prince of Hastinapur. The contest was called off, but the Yodin realized he had a powerful ally in the skilled young man, one who was potentially even greater than the most skilled of the Pandavas, Arjun. However, one person instantly realized the true identity of this young man. Tears streamed down Kunti's face as she realized her first-born son, the one she secretly floated down the river when she was a young girl, the son gifted to her by Surya, the sun god. Chapter 13 House of Fire As the years progressed, Yudhishthir's popularity among the people of Hastinapur grew. He was known for his wisdom, righteousness, and good conduct. The people wanted him as their new king as soon as possible. Under pressure from his council, King Dhritarashtra formally appointed Yudhisthir as the crown prince. This angered Duryodhana. He desired the crown for himself. His father, Dhritarashtra, was the eldest of the Kuru dynasty. But because Dhritarashtra was born blind, he was considered unable to fulfill the duties of a king. So instead, the second eldest, Pandu, the father of the Pandavas, was crowned king. When Pandu went into exile, Dhritarashtra fulfilled the duties of king. And later, when Pandu died of a curse, Dhritarashtra's reign as king was extended. Now that Yudhishthir, the eldest son of Pandu, was coming of age, Dhritarashtra's time as king was coming to an end. But Duryodhan believed that the crown should rightfully pass to him. He was the eldest son of Dhritarashtra, his father was robbed of the crown because of his disability. And yet, he had still fulfilled the duties of king for all of these years. Dhirodhan came up with a plan to rid himself of the entire Pandava family. There was an upcoming five-day festival in Vanavat, one of the kingdoms of Hastinapur. Dhirodhan went to his father, the king. Father, since Yudhisthir is the crown prince, he should represent the royal family at the festival. In fact, it would be good if the entire Pandava family went along. There are wonderful sights and sounds at Vanavat, and they would have a magnificent holiday there. The Trashra suspected the ill intentions of Dhirodhan, but he agreed to the proposal. Secretly, he desired for his own son to be the next king, and not Yudhishthir. The Trashra appointed the Pandava family to be the royal representatives at Vanavat for the festival. Yudhisthir was suspicious, but agreed to fulfill the duties required of him. Meanwhile, the Rodin had commissioned a grand mansion to be built for the Pandava family in Vanavat. But the construction crew were instructed to build the mansion from lac, an extremely inflammable substance. One of the builders involved, loyal to Vadura, the Prime Minister, sent word back of the villainous procedures involved in the construction. Vidura warned Yudhisthir ahead of their trip to Vanavat to be extremely cautious. When the Pandava brothers and Kunti arrived in Vanavat, they settled into the mansion. Four days went by with no incident and they had an enjoyable time at the festival. On the fifth night, the mansion burst into flames and the inhabitants of Vanavat watched in horror as they observed a raging inferno which no human could survive. Chapter 14 Deadly Sanctuary During the time the Pandavas and Kunti spent in Vanavat, they were on high alert for any foul schemes of Jordan. When they arrived at the mansion constructed for them, Yudhisthir could smell the scent of lac 
a highly inflammable substance. Thankfully, their uncle Vadura had warned them ahead of time. Although Duryodhan had commissioned the construction of the mansion, some of the boulders involved were loyal to Vadura. Vadura had them secretly construct an escape tunnel under the mansion. At night, the Pandavas and Kunti slept in the basement of the mansion. On the final night, Yujhtir arranged a ceremonial dinner at the mansion. The key accomplices of Dhirodhan were also invited. At the end of the function, the Brahmins were sent home, but the accomplices were kept entertained. The Pandavas and Kunti went down to the tunnels and Bhim set the house on fire as they escaped through the tunnels. Vidura had arranged a transport to take them across the river and into the forest. They dared not return to Astinapur. The Rodin had spies and assassins available everywhere. The family had to go into hiding and plan their next move. When news of the disaster reached Astinapur, the kingdom was heartbroken. Duryodhan, feigning sadness, went to Varnavat to verify the deaths himself. What was left of the bodies in the mansion was burnt beyond recognition, and Duryodhan took them as the confirmation of the end of the Pandavas and Kunti. Meanwhile, the family escaped deep into the forest. At one point, Bhim carried his mother and all of his brothers. They were exhausted from sleep and food deprivation. The family eventually fell asleep under a banyan tree, while Beam set off in search of water. When he returned with the water, he found his family still fast asleep. So he sat down on a rock and watched over them. Nearby, an evil demon of the forest smelt humans. He longed for the taste of human flesh, and he sent his demon sister off to investigate. However, when the demoness Hidimba found the humans, she was immediately overcome with desire when she saw Beam. She fell in love with the large, mighty Pandava brother. Assuming the form of a beautiful woman, Hidimba approached Beam. My dear, this forest is not safe for you and your family. My brother Hadimb is the ruling demon of this forest. He loves human flesh, best of all, and he sent me to find you for his meal tonight. But I have fallen in love with you, and I will help you and your family to escape. Before Beam could respond, a thunderous voice emanated from the forest. You treacherous wench! Now you will die along with this human family and I will have a grand meal of human and demon flesh tonight. Hidimb, Hidimba's brother, had arrived. Chapter 15 Demon Slayer When Adim saw his sister Hidimba professing her love to Beam, it threw him into a rage. You will die for betraying me. Hidim grabbed his sister by the arm. This angered Beam. Get your hands off her, demon. Fight me instead. Beam threw Hadim through the air. Hadim was taken aback by the power of the young man. But Beam was no ordinary human. He was gifted to Kunti by the wind god Vayu, and as such had immense strength since birth. And this strength was enhanced even further when he was a boy, by the Naga king Vasuki who gave him eight vats of the magical potion Rasakunda. Hidim rushed Beam, attacking him with all his beastly strength. The thunder of their encounter shook the forest and uprooted great trees. The commotion woke the rest of the Pandava family from their deep slumber. Beam's brothers readied themselves for battle, but they quickly realized there was no need. Hidim was no match for Beam, after a few minutes of battle, Beam eventually lifted Hadim above his head, spun him around and around, and finally smashed him into the ground. With a few gurgling sounds, the demon that had terrorized the inhabitants of the forest for decades was dead. Kunti noticed the beautiful woman next to them. Who are you, young lady? asked Kunti. Mother, my name is Hidimba. Your son has killed my brother Hidim. Hidim sent me to find you for his meal tonight, but I have fallen in love with your son, and I warned him of my brother's intentions instead. With your blessing, I wish to marry your son. 
Kunti noticed that Beam seemed pleased with the proposal. Very well, daughter. If my son Beam agrees, I provide you with my blessings. But on one condition. During the night, we require our son's great strength to protect us. But in the morning, and until sunset, he may spend his time with you. Beam had a second condition for the marriage to go ahead. I will spend my days with you, but only until you are blessed with a child. Then, I will return to my family. Hadimba agreed to the conditions, and Beam and her commenced their matrimonial life. In the morning, Beam left with Hadimba. In the evenings, he returned to protect his mother and brothers during the night. After some time, Hidimba gave birth to a baby boy. But this was no ordinary child. Chapter 16 Demon Son When Hidimba gave birth, due to both her and Beam's mystical nature, the child immediately grew to adult form. He was named Gatagacha due to his bald head. The child was immensely powerful. He possessed all of his father's great strength as well as his mother's mystical powers. The Pandava brothers all set about training the child. Gatagacha grew skilled in all weapons of war. His eventual weapon of preference was, like his father's, the mace. During the night, his demon powers grew even more powerful. Eventually, Gatagacha's training was completed. It was time for the Pandavas to move on. They were still wary of evading Dirodhana's spies and assassins and should not have stayed in one place for as long as they did. Kunti asked Gatagacha to remain with and watch over his mother Hidimba. Gatagacha agreed, but made a pledge that if ever his father or the rest of the Pandava family required him, he would be there in an instant to help. The family thanked him and went on their way. Along their journey, they met Sage Vyasa, the grandfather of the Pandavas, who guided them to the town of Ekachakra. In the village, they disguised themselves as the class of priests, the Brahmins, and stayed with the Brahmin family. During their time there, Bhim helped the village by slaying yet another demon, Bakasura. One day, a visiting Brahmin brought fantastic news of happenings in the kingdom of Panchala. King Drupad had long nursed a desire for revenge against Drona, the royal arms teacher of the Kurus. He performed a great sacrificial prayer to create a son who will be able to kill the great warrior Drona. His wish was granted. Out of the flames of the sacred fire stepped a powerful young man. He was named Drishtadyumya the courageous and splendid one. But then, a second figure emerged from the flames, a young woman whose beauty was unmatched. Chapter 17 Daughter of Fire When the Pandavas heard the story of the spectacular birth of King Drupad's daughter, they were greatly intrigued. Drupad had scheduled a swayamvara, a groom-choosing ceremony, for his daughter. Many of the Brahmins of Ekachakra were going to the kingdom of Panchala to attend the festival event. The Pandavas and Kunti joined in the trip. It would be good to see the spectacular kingdom of Panchala again. When they got to Panchala, after some sightseeing, Kunti stayed at the rented home while the Pandava brothers attended the Sawayamvara, like many hundreds of others from far and wide. At the stadium, the people were divided according to their caste, the division of roles in society. The Pandavas were disguised as Brahmins, the class of priests, so they sat with the other priests. The Kshatriya, the class of warriors and leaders, such as kings and princes, all sat on the opposite side of the stadium. Among these kings and princes sat the enemies of the Pandavas, the Rodna and Kana of the Kuru Empire. Drishtadyumya led his sister Draupadi onto the great stage. The people marveled at her beauty, and the Pandava brothers were no exception. This groom-choosing ceremony was unusual. It involved an exceptionally difficult challenge. 
A golden fish with a glass eye rotated at the top of a tall pole. A reflective surface was positioned at the bottom of the pole. To win the hand of Draupadi, the suitor would need to lift an incredibly heavy bow, string it, and then shoot an arrow to hit the eye of the moving golden fish at the top of the pole. But they would have to take aim and fire the arrow while looking at their target in the reflective surface below. King Drupad had specifically designed such a difficult task because secretly he desired a son-in-law like the great warrior Arjuna. But as far as everyone knew, Arjuna had perished with the rest of the family in the burning house of Vandavat. So he would settle for a suitor who could at least come close to matching the skill of Arjun. The potential suitors in the stadium grumbled at the ridiculous difficulty of the task presented. It seemed impossible. Nevertheless, many of the princes, kings and great warriors assembled made their attempts. One by one, they failed hopelessly. Eventually, Kana, the close friend of Dirodin, made his way to the arena to make his attempt. The people mumbled amongst themselves. Although Dirodin had gifted Kana a kingdom, Kana was the adopted son of a charioteer, which made him of the class of laborers, the Shudra. Kana picked up the bow, but before he could make his attempt, Draupadi called out loudly and clearly, I will not wear the Shudra. Kana grimaced as his blood boiled at the insult. The sun itself seemed to reflect his anger, but he held his composure and put down the bow without making his attempt. Then, when it seemed that no one remained who was brave or foolish enough to make any further attempts, a young Brahmin made his way to the arena to try his hand. The people were shocked. A Brahmin attempting to achieve something that no Kshatriya could do? It was ridiculous. The young man was Arjuna in disguise. Chapter 18 Victory The people marveled at this foolish young priest who was attempting to shoot the eye of the revolving fish. So many of the members of the Kshatriyas, the warrior class, had attempted the feat and all had failed. The one person who could possibly have succeeded was Kana, and he had been rebuked by Draupadi since he was of Shudra, the labor class. Now a priest, a member of the Brahmin class, was attempting a task that required great skill with a weapon of war. It was preposterous. The young man strung the bow with ease and handled the weapon with a familiarity that contradicted his peaceful appearance. He looked at the moving target in the reflective pool and took aim. He held his breath and released the arrow. The arrow flew through the air and found the eye of the golden fish dead on target. The crowd went silent. The kings, princes and the rest of the Kshatriya class of warriors were shocked. They could not believe what they saw. Then the silent disbelief turned to scowls of anger. This is a trick. Drupad has brought us here to make fools of us. There is no way a Brahmin boy could exceed us in the use of a weapon of war. The crowd of Kshatriyas was turning into a mob. Kill Drupad, burn his daughter, shouted one. A crowd of Kshatriyas stormed towards the royal family, weapons in hand. Arjun loaded the bow and with ease dispatched the approaching mob. Kana watched the happenings with interest. He too believed the Brahmin's victory was a trick or a simple matter of luck. He released a volley of arrows at the young Brahmin. But Arjun, in the disguise of the Brahmin, easily counted all of Kana's attacks. Then he released his own attack on Kana. Kana deflected the attack, but just barely and it required all of his great skill to not be killed by the young man. Kana was shocked. Never had he witnessed such great archery skills. And from a Brahmin? With a tone of wonder and admiration, Kana asked, Who are you, young Brahmin? Are you Lord Vishnu or Indra in human disguise? I have fought no other warrior with your level of skill. Arjun, with a disguised voice, shouted out, my guru has taught me all there is to know in the weapons of war. You are no match for me, Kana. Beware. 
and Kana, for the first time in any of his battles, felt fear. Other Kshatriyas, such as the incredibly strong Shalya, joined in the attack, but he was easily taken out by Bhim. Arjun's other brothers also joined in the defense, supported by Brahmins and the crowd with them. Much of the audience left the stadium to avoid injury, but almost all remained bewildered as to who these mysterious Brahmins might be. However, the true identity of the five Brahmins could not be hidden from one in the stadium. In this form, he was the nephew of Kunti and cousin to the Pandava brothers. He of the Yadava clan, Lord Krishna. Chapter 19 The Five Husbands Once the crowd had settled down, Draupadi completed the Swayamvara by garlanding the winner and accepting the Brahmin as a husband. The outcome had puzzled King Drupad. A Brahmin who was able to succeed in such a difficult archery competition was most unusual. Drupad instructed his son, Dristadumya, to investigate the matter further. The Brahmins left the stadium with Draupadi and set off to their rented home in Panchala. Before entering the home, Arjun playfully called out, Mother, look what I have brought home! Kunti, who was deep in prayer, replied, Whatever it might be, make sure to share equally with your brothers. When Kunti turned and saw Draupadi, she realized her mistake and was horrified. She had thought Arjun had returned with food for their dinner. Now they were in a quandary. To fulfill Dharma, right action, a mother's words must be adhered to. Kunti turned to Yudhisthir the Just to get guidance on the situation. But before he could answer, Draupadi spoke out. Mother, do not be concerned. This situation was preordained. Sometime after my fire birth, Sage Vyasa visited and provided more insight into my past. In my previous life, I performed great penance to obtain a wish from Lord Shiva. I asked for a husband who would be a symbol of Dharma, justice. He should be as strong as Lord Hanuman. He should be as skilled in archery as Lord Parashurama. He should be as intelligent as Lord Brihaspati, and he should be the most handsome man on earth. Lord Shiva replied that such qualities were not possible to be contained in a single mortal. This would upset the natural balance of nature. Nevertheless, I repeated my desire to Lord Shiva five times, and finally he acquiesced. I see now how the Lord has granted my wish. Just then, a knock at the door interrupted them. It was Lord Krishna and his brother Balarama. Lord Krishna had recognized the Pandavas at the Swayamvara and came to pay his respects to his aunt Kunti and his cousins. The family was overjoyed to see them, and Kunti related all that had happened to her nephew. Lord Krishna advised that the marriage of Draupadi was in full accordance with Dharma, since, in addition to Lord Shiva's blessing, the five Pandava brothers also shared one soul. They were all incarnations of Lord Indra. This settled Kunti, and they discussed how they would break the news to King Drupad. However, all that they had discussed inside the house would make its way to King Drupad quicker than they imagined. Hiding outside the home, Drupad's son, Drishtadumya, had overheard everything. Chapter 20 The Divided Kingdom the news of the Pandavas being alive made its way to Astinapur rapidly. Now that the Pandava brothers were united with King Drupad's family, they had the protection of the kingdom of Panchala. This disturbed King Dhritarashtra and his son Duryodhan. Now that Yudhishthir was an adult, by rights the throne of Astinapur should pass to him. He was the eldest son of King Pandu and Tetrashtra served only as the caretaker king. The fact that the failed assassination of the Pandava family was a plot by Dhirodhan was now an open secret. In council with Kana, they discussed a possible attack on Panchala to take the kingdom and slay the Pandavas. But to wage open war, they would need the blessing of Grandfather Bhishma and Prime Minister Vidura. Bhishma and Vidura quickly dismissed the ridiculous idea. 
By rights, the throne should pass to Yudhisthir. But to keep peace, they proposed a division in the kingdom. Half that would be ruled by Yudhisthir, and the other half by Dhirodhan. The Drashtra grudgingly agreed, and the region of Kandaprashtra was granted to Yudhisthir. The Pandavas agreed to the terms, and Yudhisthir began his reign in the region. Yudhisthir was the symbol of justice, truth and moral duty. The region under his kingship quickly became prosperous, and they built a new capital called Indraprashtra. One day, the Pandavas were visited by sage Narada. The sage warned them the situation with Draupadi as their common wife could lead to division between the brothers, which would be the greatest threat to the kingdom. In consultation with the sage, Draupadi and her husbands came to an agreement that if any of the other brothers entered the chambers of Draupadi while she was with another brother, the offending brother would need to spend 12 years in exile. One day, a priest came to Arjun begging for assistance. Robbers were taking his cattle. To capture them and recover the farmer's belongings, Arjun would have to act fast. However, his weapons happened to be in Draupadi's chamber. It was Arjun's duty to act as protector to the people, and without a second thought, he entered the chamber and retrieved his weapons. Draupadi was with Yudhisthir at the time. Arjun made short work of the thieves, but he would now have to face the consequences of his action. Thank you for watching so far. I hope you enjoyed. If you did, please hit the like button. If you're new here, please subscribe. This will ensure that more people can find this resource. Click the notification button so that you can be the first to know about new uploads. And please do comment below. I'll do my best to reply to any questions. Thank you.